As I'm recording this in the summer of 2022, it's become much more common for us to have conversations with our patients about changing from sleeve to gastric bypass. I think this is happening uh, both because time is showing us that there are some weak spots with the sleeve and also because in the last 15 years a lot of sleeve operations have been done. In my experience, two factors are dominant in bringing patients to the discussion about changing from a sleeve to a gastric bypass. The first factor is reflux and heartburn, and the second factor is weight gain over time. Um, in my mind, in my experience, the uh, case for changing from sleeve to gastric bypass to treat reflux um, is very compelling if medical therapy is not successful. Um, I think that it can be very reasonable to change from sleeve to bypass to try to get better weight control, although the results are not as compelling, and I'm going to come to that second. Just to make sure we're on the same page with the reflux conversion conversation, let's talk about what is reflux and heartburn and what can it do and how does it happen? Why is it more common with a sleeve? So first of all, what it is in general, whether you have a sleeve or you don't have a sleeve, is it's the um, return of or the reflux of fluid contents from the stomach and just downstream back up into the esophagus. And these fluid or maybe food contents, but mostly fluid, um, usually contain acid and they may also contain digestive juices from further downstream like bile and pancreas fluid. And of course, these fluids in combination are meant to digest foods and break them down so they can be absorbed. And so they can be kind of harsh or caustic. And um, everybody has a little bit of this backwashing fluid or this refluxing fluid from time to time, uh, but a little bit is the key, um, and it should not be a lot, and it should not be ongoing. Now, recent reports are showing us that the sleeve is associated with a pretty significant increase in reflux over time, especially when you get to 10 and 15 years after the sleeve. And this may be prominent in people who had reflux before and now it's just worse, or it may be in people who did not have any reflux before. And to my knowledge, researchers are still looking for the reason for this, but basically it seems to be the case that just like food and fluid can go down, um, food and fluid can also wash back up in the context of the sleeve. And as I mentioned, um, when this caustic or this harsh digestive juice gets back up into the esophagus, which is a little bit delicate, which is not supposed to see these caustic fluids, it typically leads to feelings of pain or heartburn. Um, sometimes the amount of fluid coming back up can be so much that you actually feel the fluid reflux all the way back up to here and sometimes come out of the nose and stuff like that, although that's uncommon. Um, and there's another scenario where uh, people that have fluid reflux and the fluid just kind of remains in their esophagus, they lay down at night and gravity is no longer helping keep this stuff down because they're flat. Um, some of that fluid can wash back up into the lungs um, and they, even if you have just a few drops of this fluid go into the lungs, that's called aspiration, then that leads to terrible irritation in the lungs and uh, people People have the experience of waking up and coughing like crazy. They don't know why. They can't stop coughing for a long time. And um, so that can be what's called reflux aspiration. It's a pretty serious condition. Another way that reflux and irritation can show up is with a condition called esophageal spasm. And in this situation, the irritation that's kind of ongoing from these um, irritating juices causes the muscles of the esophagus to become irritable and uh, the esophagus, which normally moves in a very nicely coordinated, um, powerful but controlled way, um, begins to have spasm of its muscles from the irritation like a charley horse in the chest. And uh, patients who have experienced this say that it's one of the worst pains that you can imagine, um, kind of on the same level as a heart attack. It's often confused with a heart attack at first, on the same level as a gallbladder attack or a kidney stone um, or childbirth. And so this esophageal spasm from reflux is far from universal, uh, but it can be a characteristic finding with reflux that goes on over some time. Interestingly, the research is showing us that uh, sometimes the reflux and the irritation can happen without being felt very much. So in other words, um, a patient can have these digestive juices come back up into the esophagus and remain there with some regularity, um, especially with the sleeve, and, um, and they don't really feel them. And this seems to be more associated um, with uh, not the acid secretions, but the bile and the pancreatic secretion. So it's actually coming from a little bit further down. And again, why this happens exactly in the sleeve is not clear, but the significance of it is that when um, these uh, mixture of digestive secretions get into the esophagus, they start by causing irritation, kind of like a sunburn, but they can go on over time to cause injury or damage 
damage. And the esophagus tries to heal from this. And um, in the healing process, it may develop some abnormal cell growth and get into a condition that's called Barrett's esophagus. And Barrett's esophagus typically happens at the bottom end of the esophagus. It's a condition where the lining of the, of the, uh, the cellular makeup changes in a way that isn't cancer, but it has a little bit more of a chance of cancer. And so uh, recognizing this, and, and the big case series that talked about this was actually published just last summer in the summer of 2021, um, our society has now recommended that everyone who has a sleeve should have an upper scope, it's also called an upper endoscopy, to be done every five years so that we can look at this area and make sure that we are not having injury or damage to the esophagus. And as I said, people can have reflux and heart sorry, they can have reflux that is medically significant without feeling it very well. And so it's important to have this so-called surveillance endoscopy, even if they do not feel heartburn or feel bad in any way. So if you're feeling some heartburn and reflux, the first thing is to make sure that you are connected with your bariatric team because your bariatric team is going to have the best understanding and the best expertise for treating this condition at the appropriate level. The bariatric team is typically not gonna jump right into surgery. We're gonna start with lifestyle treatment and then talk about medications. And then if we need to, we might talk about surgical stuff and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, typical lifestyle changes would be things like avoiding foods that promote reflux, like um, chocolate sorry, alcohol, spicy foods. Uh, it's going to involve things like avoiding eating and avoiding drinking for a certain time period before you lay down. In other words, let gravity get everything down as well as possible before you lay down flat because when you lay down flat, things are going to start washing back up if they're still in your stomach. Um, thinking about gravity, we may get some uh, blocks under the head of your bed so that your bed has just a slight incline. Again, using gravity to help us keep those fluids down. Um, moving beyond lifestyle changes, uh, very often medicines can be used to help bring reflux under control. There's three general categories of medicines that are used in this scenario. First of all, there are acid blockers that are available over the counter or by prescription. Number two, there are some coating or soothing medicines such as caraphate that can help calm the burn part of this. Number three, and this is typically done one stage at a time, um, a medicine called metaclopramide can actually accelerate the movement of the stomach and um, contents like digestive juices going downstream so they don't get back up here very much. Now these things are used selectively. Um, I think also as part of the evaluation for reflux, your surgeon is probably going to want to check your surgical anatomy to make sure there's not a kink or a fold or a blockage. And that surgical anatomy can be checked with the endoscopy, which again, endoscopy is a good idea to make sure there's not any damage or excessive irritation of the esophagus. Or in other circumstances, the um, checking of the anatomy can be done using an upper GI x-ray where you swallow some chalky stuff and we watch how it flows down and, um, and see if it hangs up at any location. Now, if all these interventions, the lifestyle and the multiple medical levels, if they are not successful, meaning that you still have intolerable reflux and heartburn, and maybe you've got this aspiration, maybe you're actually spitting up acid, um, maybe there are signs of Barrett's esophagus, but for whatever reason, if we decide that your condition is beyond the um, successful treatment with medical therapy, um, that's where surgery may be appropriate. And, and the substance of my talk for you here today is about the conversion from the sleeve to the gastric bypass. Um, how that works and how it looks. Okay, and so um, if it's determined between you and the surgeon that the gastric bypass is what's necessary, then the surgeon is going to go in typically using almost the same incisions and they're going to cut across the upper part of your stomach and they're going to create that little stomach pouch that's the characteristic of the gastric bypass. And that little stomach pouch is small enough that it really doesn't make any acid. We're really thinking of it as a connection between your esophagus and the small intestine. So in the operating room, the surgeon, once they cut across the stomach there momentarily, there's no place for the food to go. Now there needs to be a plan. And so the surgeon is going to also make a disconnection of the intestine in the center of your abdomen. And he's going to bring one section up to attach that stomach pouch. That's going to become the new pathway for your food. Now, you do still want to have the acid and the digestive juices that mix with the food, but one key about the gastric bypass as it relates to reflux is that those digestive juices are going to follow a different pathway. They're going to come from the lower part of the stomach and the duodenum, and they're going to join with the food way downstream where the surgeon is making a separate connection. And so at least in theory, those digestive juices are far enough downstream that they physically cannot get back up to the esophagus.
And this is how the gastric bypass is a great treatment for reflux and heartburn, whether that's coming from sleeve or even for some patients who have terrible reflux and heartburn who have not had any bariatric surgery, the gastric bypass is very effective for treating reflux and those folks as well. Now, most sleeve patients who have this revision from sleeve to gastric bypass will find that the, the magnitude or the recovery from the surgery is about the same as it was for the sleeve. Um, the operation typically takes an hour to two hours. Uh, people go home later in the same day or very often the next day. Um, our practice recommends the same vitamins for the sleeve as for the gastric bypass um, and recommends the same follow-up plan and the same food plan for both operations. Uh, I will leave it to your individual bariatric practice to determine exactly what your recovery plan is and exactly what your recommendations are. Now, having said that, um, the process is usually of about the same magnitude as the original sleeve was. Um, I do want to be clear and note that this is a revision bariatric operation. And what I mean by that is that your surgeon is, is talking about going in and working on stomach that has already been operated on. It has some staple lines, it has some scar tissue, and whereas most of the time all that heals okay, the healing is not as reliable as if there was never any previous surgery. And so, Coming from a sleeve to a gastric bypass, there is a significantly higher chance of bleeding um, or damage to internal organs um, or ulcers or narrowing at the connection between the little stomach pouch and the intestine. These things are typically manageable, but going from one operation to another is not always a really easy thing or a chip shot. Now. Um, my focus again is talking about gastric bypass as an option for sleeve with reflux, but I want to have two acknowledgments here. Um, one acknowledgement is that uh, it is very commonly discussed in surgical circles to convert a sleeve, if necessary, to a different operation called a duodenal switch. Now, I think that a duodenal switch can be a very effective weight loss operation if a person has not lost sufficient weight from a sleeve. Um, it remains to be seen if it's a useful reflux operation. There is some rerouting of the digestive juices that can be useful. Um, so the information is still developing on the option for a duodenal switch. I have not added it to my armamentarium, uh, but it's something definitely that we're keeping an eye on. The second acknowledgement or recognition is that uh, a lot of people who chose a sleeve when they had their surgery, in a sense, chose against gastric bypass. So this may not be a nice conversation for them. And um, I want to try to put this a little bit into perspective, and this is addressed in some other videos that I've put out, but um, just to say that uh, in our experience at this time, the magnitude, um, the risk factors, uh, the recovery process, the life changes um, between sleeve and gastric bypass are very similar to each other. Um, I think there was a time period when uh, surgeons, including me, um, in, in the late 2010s and into the 20 teens, um, felt pretty enthusiastic about the sleeve over the gastric bypass um, because it's technically a bit simpler to do. And um, in most of surgery, technical simplicity usually correlates with lower risk. Um, and I think that uh, we had the feeling of lower risk, although um, the big risks like bleeding and leak um, and pulmonary embolus turn out to be about the same between sleeve and gastric bypass. Um, in fairness, gastric bypass has a chance of bowel obstruction that sleeve does not have. Uh, it's a small percentage, but it's there. Uh, but also in fairness, we're seeing over time that the sleeve has its own set of previously unsuspected issues like the reflux that we're talking about. So. Um, I would tell you that the current data seems to show that these operations are much more equivalent than had been perceived. And I think the other thing that uh, was out there, especially in the 2008-2012 uh, timeframe, was a bit of leftover lap band marketing. And again, I've, I've put this into another video, but um, just suffice it to say that lap band marketing, and by the way, lap band's not done anymore, in my opinion, um, lap band marketing was focused on making the gastric bypass look like a bigger, scarier operation than it really was, because when the lap band came out, the gastric bypass was the only competition. Sleeve came later. And so um, that's just another food for thought, and uh, it's definitely something to talk individually with your surgeon about. Um, and I mentioned it just to recognize that you may have some built-in hesitation about the gastric bypass as an option.
One surgical option I would not recommend if you're having reflux uh, with your sleeve is changing to a mini gastric bypass. And um, I was actually a little bit surprised when I was doing my internet research in preparation for this video to find that there is a lot of marketing, especially from south of the border, um, a little bit in Houston too, um, marketing towards sleeve reflux patients to get them to have this operation that's a mini gastric bypass. And the mini gastric bypass um, is a simplification of the standard Ruin Y gastric bypass. And I should have used that term earlier. When I talk about revising, I'm talking about revising not just to gastric bypass, but I'm talking about revising to Ruin Y gastric bypass, which is the standard gastric bypass. The problem with the mini gastric bypass is that uh, the mini gastric bypass just brings up a single loop of the intestine and attaches it onto this little stomach pouch. And um, that loop of intestine doesn't divert the caustic juices away from the stomach. It actually brings them right up there actually a little bit closer to the esophagus. And uh, this so-called one anastomosis gastric bypass or loop gastric bypass was actually done way back in the 80s and the 90s and was shown to be much more associated with reflux and problems. So in my mind, that would not be a good choice if reflux is your problem with a sleeve. It would be a seriously incomplete conversation about reflux and revision surgery if we didn't talk about hiatal hernia. First, I'm going to talk to you about what a hiatal hernia is, uh, its connection with reflux, um, and also is there ever a situation where a person might have just a hiatal hernia repair and not a revision or conversion to gastric bypass in the context of failed medical therapy. So let me explain first of all the anatomy as best I can. So um, in normal anatomy, before any bariatric surgery, there is the esophagus, which is the swallowing tube, that joins with the large stomach. And at the place where they join, at the top of the stomach, there's a ring of muscle that is like a support structure. And it's a natural necessary gap in the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the big sheet-like or dome-like muscle that separates the abdomen from the chest. So it's a gap in the diaphragm, and it's supposed to be snug so that it supports the connection of the esophagus and the stomach stable in place. Now it's pretty common for that ring of muscle to become loosened a little bit and that is a hiatal hernia. And uh, the significance of that before any bariatric surgery is that it's usually not that big of a deal because um, having the large normal stomach, it can slide back and forth a little bit with no damage. And there is a significant statistical correlation of hiatal hernia with reflux and heartburn, although uh, most would agree that the hiatal hernia doesn't itself cause reflux and heartburn. Um, most surgeons, if they do surgery to fix reflux, would also fix the hiatal hernia. Now, if you're a sleeve patient, you may have already had a hiatal hernia repair at the time of your sleeve surgery. Why is that? It's because um, we know that unlike the normal large non-surgical stomach, the sleeve is very sensitive or susceptible to any small hiatal hernia or any excess movement at that location that we call the hiatus. And there's a couple factors going on here. One thing is that the sleeve is just skinny. And so it's, it's kind of easy for large sections of the sleeve to get up into this little gap. Let's say it's a small gap rather than a really big one. And the other thing is that the sleeve has a staple line on one side. It's the patient's left side. And that staple line tends to stick to tissue. So the sleeve doesn't tend to move up and down smoothly. The sleeve tends to fold over and twist at being fixed to that muscle at one point. And so the sleeve, in the context of even a small hiatal hernia, is much more prone to twist or fold or to have a partial blockage. Now let's talk about what symptoms happen from exactly what conditions with the hiatal hernia. And I'm going to teach you a new thing. I'm going to teach you about dysphagia. Dysphagia is the medical term for I can't swallow very well or food hangs up on me. And I, I bring this into it because in my understanding, a hiatal hernia does cause dysphagia in the context of sleeve because if the sleeve is getting twisted or folded, then it's actually physically hard for food to go down. And so you can feel this sensation of a blockage anywhere from where the problem is all the way up to here. 
it may not be that the food's blocking all the way up to here, but the the esophagus is is coordinated, like I mentioned earlier, and it's networked top to bottom. So if there's a problem here, you may feel resistance all the way up here, or you may feel a spasm because the food can't go past this area. So dysphagia can be a very uh, harsh negative feeling that can be anywhere in the chest above where the problem takes place. And dysphagia is a bit more likely to happen with thick foods like beef or uh, fresh breads, which of course you're not supposed to have fresh breads anyway, but let's talk about real life. Um, that might be one of the foods that's more likely to hang up on you. And um, I think it can be useful to talk about dysphagia, the swallowing difficulty, separate from reflux, which is the sensation of heartburn, and it's the physical return of caustic juices back up into the esophagus because these are going to have slightly different treatment plans. Now, they do often go together, okay, and, and sometimes reflux and heartburn because they cause irritation of the esophagus can cause the esophagus not to move well, and reflux and heartburn can cause dysphagia. So there's a lot of overlap, but the reason I bring this up is that um, in my experience, if a sleeve patient has a hiatal hernia, and if they have reflux, then by all means, and this is after treating with medicine and everything, by all means, if they have reflux, we should go fix that hiatal hernia. But I've done this, and just fixing the hiatal hernia alone in a sleeve patient typically will not fix the reflux and the heartburn because those caustic juices are still there. And just like stuff can go down, stuff can come back up. And so I try to steer my sleeve patients away from just fixing the hiatal hernia, except in a rare circumstance. And this is why I brought the dys dysphagia into it. If one of my sleeve patients has just the swallowing difficulty, like things don't go down well, but not heartburn and reflux, and in other words, they're not feeling heartburn and they're not having aspiration, and if we do a scope and we don't see um, irritation of the esophagus and we don't see Barrett's esophagus, if it's just the hiatal hernia with dysphagia, then it can be useful to just fix the hiatal hernia, okay? So all of that was a long soliloquy about hiatal hernia to say that usually, yes, a hiatal hernia should be fixed. Usually it should be fixed in connection with revision to gastric bypass unless it is an isolated dysphagia problem. Now, uh, let me say one other thing about hiatal hernia because it also often comes up as, well, shucks, if my surgeon fixed this hiatal hernia five years ago, why do I have a hiatal hernia now? And this gets to the fact that um, you know this is a gap in the diaphragm. We surgeons can't just close it off. That would be a really strong way of repairing it, but the esophagus has got to go through there. So what we're really doing is we're not removing a hernia or blocking a hernia. We're snugging up that muscle, and with time, and with the melting of fatty tissues that may be in that gap, um, it does tend to get a little bit looser. So a given hiatal hernia repair is good for five years or 10 years or maybe 15 years. But um, honestly, when we fix hiatal hernias, they don't stay fixed forever and ever. Now let's take this to another step. What if we have a gastric bypass in a hiatal hernia? It can happen that a person has dysphagia and swallowing problems, but it's much less likely. Actually, it's, it seems to be the case that this little gastric pouch seems to be a little bit more uh, resistant or resilient in the context of hiatal hernia. So it's a bit less common that we have what we call symptomatic hiatal hernias in gastric bypass. And now going back to the situation just where it's the sleeve and inadequate weight loss, I definitely want our patients to get engaged with the medical team before we start talking seriously about surgical revision. Um, one other um, thing I want to mention just to set it aside is this idea of re-sleeving. Um, the idea of reworking a sleeve and making the sleeve skinnier um, came out almost immediately after the sleeve was first done. And um, I've had some direct experience with this, as most surgeons have. And, uh, I can tell you that a re-sleeve is not surgically or medically a good idea. Um, the less important factor is that it doesn't lead to that much weight loss to just make the sleeve skinnier. Uh, but the second thing is that going back and reworking the sleeve is surgically and technically actually really hard. Um, and it's hard to create a nice uniform narrow sleeve and maintain good blood flow to all the sections of the sleeve that you've just created because of potential crossing of the staple lines. And so um, there's a sense in which the uh, idea of re-sleeving actually has a much higher complication rate than changing to a gastric bypass or changing to a uh, duodenal switch.
Let's go back to one of the other valid reasons for having a conversation about changing from a sleeve to a gastric bypass, and that is to have the goal of weight loss. Maybe you're a person who lost substantial weight and then gained it back, and unfortunately we are seeing that a little bit more with sleeve. Or maybe you're a person who never lost as much weight as they wanted to with the sleeve originally. And um, Either one of these scenarios seems to happen a little bit more often in um, women who are older than 40 years old, but it can happen to kind of anyone in the entire bariatric population. And um, I do think it's, uh, as we understand the bariatric procedures on a hormonal level, there do seem to be some differences in the hormonal effect or the hormonal benefit, the hormonal impact between sleeve and gastric bypass. And so it's medically reasonable to expect some different sense of weight loss or some different sensation of hunger once a person has changed from sleeve to gastric bypass. But honestly, um, in my experience, people lose 30, maybe 60 pounds um, after revision from sleeve to gastric bypass. And um, depending on where you begin, that may be satisfactory, it may not. I don't want to oversell the experience of weight loss. Um, I can reassure you um, that if you're a sleeve patient who is at a very good weight, and we're talking about the revision um, procedure because of reflux, I can reassure you that you're not going to to lose excessive weight. Um, and as I discussed in other videos, the hormonal changes of these operations is working on your excess fat stores. It's not going to have an adverse impact on your nutrition control system. And so regardless of where your weight begins, um, you're not going to lose an excessive or an unhealthy amount of weight. Okay. Although I haven't added duodenal switch to my own surgical armamentarium, I'll tell you why in a second, um, I do think it's fair to talk just a bit about how one might change from a sleeve to a duodenal switch. And if you look at the diagram side by side, you can see that both of the operations have a narrower stomach. And so they share this. And so surgically, it's actually not um, too big of an operation to do the second part of the duodenal switch, which is to reroute the intestines in a way that there is less food absorption. And probably there's a new hormonal impact that comes into it as well. And uh, contrary to the um, situation of gastric bypass coming from a sleeve where the weight loss results are moderate, um, the results of weight loss coming from a sleeve to a duodenal switch are very good and sometimes even excessive, but very good and clearly better than gastric bypass. Um, my caution about duodenal switch is not a surgical technical one, but um, part of the way the duodenal switch works is by intentionally reducing the uh, natural absorption of food and nutrients, which includes vitamins and also some of the macronutrients, so that um, at least in past experience with the duodenal switch, uh, there was a real potential for people having actual deficiencies and damage uh, later in life. Now, um, in recent years, this duodenal switch has been modified and um, it's being said and published that these problems aren't showing up as much. So um, keeping an open mind and we may have a different conversation in two to five years. Before I finish this video, I want to balance things out a little bit. The purpose of this video, the assumption of this video, is to provide information for people where the sleeve has problems or has failed in some way. And so uh, some people watching this video uh, might be disheartened and wonder, well, why did we ever pick a sleeve? Or my sleeve is just fine right now, but am I doomed? And I want to give you some reassurance. The sleeve continues to be a very good operation that leads to a lot of weight loss and a lot of health benefit for a lot of people. And um, as we surgeons are having discussions with our patients about what surgery that we're going to do in their case, um, hopefully it's a collaborative discussion. And one thing that I've learned is that patients need to be really pretty comfortable with the option that we choose. And some patients have a valid, appropriate vibe for this um, sort of cleaner looking sleeve operation versus the more um, complex looking gastric bypass procedure. And that is not to be dismissed by any means. Um, I still do around 30% sleeve operations and I feel very happy if my patient and I select that operation. And in hopes of minimizing second guessing, I'll say it again that a lot of the information that is leading to these conversations about revision just came out in the summer of 2021. So um, most people watching this video had a sleeve with a different set of information for both you and for your surgical team. And even with this recent cautionary information in hand, I think there are a number of circumstances where the sleeve remains the right operation going forward into the 2020s and the 2030s. First of all, if a patient has recent or ongoing tobacco use, for me that's a strong indication in favor of sleeve.
because, and of course we want you to stop smoking to be ready for surgery, but um, the gastric bypass is very sensitive to any tobacco smoke and at any point in the future, even five years later, three cigarettes. The sleeve, um, and not that smoking is healthy for you, but the sleeve is fairly resilient against future tobacco use. So um, if you're a patient who is quitting smoking to get ready for surgery, um, unless you have an exceptionally strong commitment against smoking in the long run, it's probably gonna be smart for you to go in the direction of a sleeve to avoid those ulcer problems that can happen with gastric bypass and tobacco. In a similar way, if you have medical conditions that necessitate your continued intake of aspirin or related medicines, and related medicines would be like Motrin, Aleve, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, and these kinds of things, there again, because of ulcers, uh, sleeve might be a better choice for you. Now, um, for both operations, we wanna hold these medicines right around surgery because they can uh, uh, cause free bleeding, they thin the blood, but uh, in the long run, the sleeve can be tolerant of these medicines like naproxen and Motrin and aspirin, whereas the gastric bypass is very intolerant of these medicines. Now, if there are other situations where you need a gastric bypass, we can usually substitute other medicines, but let's just put that as a factor out there. Um, if you are a patient who has had really extensive prior abdominal surgery, um, a major colon resection, perforation, or if you've got complexity manifested by a big old hernia, a ventral hernia, then the sleeve can be a better operation in those situations as well because what's happening in that low middle abdomen is that the small intestine is becoming surgically inaccessible and we can do the sleeve by sneaking around that trouble and just going to the upper abdomen versus if we need to do the gastric bypass, we have to free up all of that small intestine, um, adding substantial surgical complexity and in surgery, complexity equals risk. And so that can be a factor. If you are a patient who has um, other very complex medical conditions like a heart transplant or a liver transplant or uh, ongoing chemotherapy from some other cause, um, that would not be a strict contraindication to gastric bypass, but it could be something a little bit more in favor of sleeve, which is usually a slightly shorter operation. Um, and in which physicians in general uh, trust the absorption of medicines more. Now, in my experience, there has not been an absorption problem with medicines in gastric bypass, but it's a team situation, and so sleeve can be useful in that scenario. And in the last, I would say the least common scenario where a sleeve could be favored is if you know that your near-term life is going to involve um, being out in um, what we might call an austere medical environment. Let's say you're gonna go on active duty and deploy to Afghanistan, or maybe not Afghanistan, but um, you know, the other Middle East location, hopefully nothing, um, then um, it might be nice to know that you have no chance from us of having a bowel obstruction. And you know, the bowel obstruction can come from gastric bypass. Um, that's a rare percentage, but it's the kind of thing where it's nice to be uh, around medical care. Um, yeah, so if you're going to an austere environment, if you're gonna be an astronaut, sleeve might be better than gastric bypass. So if you and I choose a sleeve operation and you're in this uh, minority of patients who comes back seven or 15 years later and we need to have a conversation about revision from sleeve to gastric bypass, I don't think it's a tragedy. And I mean, I like operating, but um, if I can choose with you for us to have one operation that gives you lasting health and weight control, um, that would be my preference. Closing all this out, I think that the key thing is to have a conversation with a bariatric team about having a bariatric procedure and to go into this with eyes open. If you're a person who's already had a bariatric procedure, if you've had the sleeve and if you're struggling, then I hope this information is on target to help you move forward in a way that is happy and healthy. I wish you the best of luck on your journey.